At face value, community theater might not be the most exciting phrase in the English language. Most of us probably have memories of being dragged to a production of My Fair Lady with our grandparents, or maybe you're like me, a theater kid who fell away from the stage as he got older. Either way, the phrase brings to mind a dark room, the audience shifting in their seats as the curtain rises, revealing a cast of familiar faces. A local teacher, a soccer mom, maybe even your doctor each of them projecting out into the darkness, behaving a little differently than you've ever seen them before. But here, at the Anna Maria Island Players, it's not just the actors who have character. This building, an unassuming wooden structure on the north end of the island, has been around for so long, it could tell stories to rival that of Tennessee Williams. Anna Maria Island. A seven mile long paradise just off the coast of Bradenton, Florida, is a vacation spot to most, but to a few lucky Floridians, it's home. Brilliant blue waves hug glistening white sand beaches and some of the best seafood you'll ever have, in my opinion. There are several accounts of how the island got its name, one even claiming a Tampa mayor picked Anna Maria for his wife Maria and her sister, Anna, a real two birds, one stone kind of guy. Still don't know why the wife's name is second. But, considering the name is referenced by 16th century Spanish maps, it seems more likely Spanish Catholics are the origin. After all, no one expects the Inquisition. To better understand this tropical town, the crew and I had to make a stop at the Anna Maria Island Historical Society, where we met Barb and Liz, two wonderful ladies that gave us more old news clippings than we knew what to do with. With our newfound wealth of info, we were able to delve into the history of the island, and more specifically, the building that now houses the players. And while its current location on Pine Avenue and Gulf Drive is where this cultural gem now resides, that wasn't always the case. Instead, our search brought us further inland to a rural town named Parrish, Florida. The year is 1912. Fenway Park is opened. New Mexico and Arizona are admitted as the 47th and 48th states respectively. And somewhere in the Atlantic, the Titanic is hitting an iceberg. But back in Florida, an ambitious project is underway. The building we know as the Anna Maria Island Players is currently known as the Gillett Family Household, and the region north of the Manatee River has been homesteaded by three families, the Parishes, the Lambs, and of course, the Gillets. Immigrating from Georgia to Florida prior to the Civil War, Daniel Gillett, father of William, brought his family to an area near Tampa Bay called Frog Creek. Like many of the other transplants to the area, the Gillets found success in cattle farming and the cultivation of citrus. So much success that the settlement of Frog Creek became synonymous with the name Gillet. And by 1895, the local post office shared the family name. Records are unclear about who built the Gillet house, but by the end of the Civil War, the structure served as a home for Daniel, his wife Malsey, and their eight children. The Gillet family maintained their estate for the next four decades. But what about the ambitious project? Well, at the ripe old age of 70, William H. Gillett suffered from heart failure and met an unfortunate end while out hunting squirrels with his wife, Araby, and his son, Grover. Following William's death, the Gilletts began to feel their homestead manor was a growing liability and decided to sell it off. And the buyer, the Anna Maria Island Beach Company, closed the deal with the family. But there was still one daunting detail. How do you move such a large wooden structure through the harsh, untamed Florida landscape to a secluded tropical island 25 miles away. Prior to the 1980s, a decade where the general attitude seemed to be, nah, we'll make another one, tearing down a building was a rarity. Instead, structures like houses were often repurposed and relocated. 19th and early 20th century movers would use teams of horses to slowly drag a building off of its foundation and then to the new desired location. Now, pulling the Gillett family home from Parrish to Anna Maria Island came with one particularly glaring obstacle, the Manatee River. 
This 36 mile long waterway just south of Tampa Bay splits the region in two. Parrish, Palmetto and Ruskin to the north and Bradenton to the south. The plan was set. The Gillett House would be pulled to the banks of the Manatee River and then set adrift on a barge, allowing it to float to the mouth of the river and ultimately the north end of Anna Maria Island. But like all the best plans, one last obstacle made itself clear. The Gillett House would be far too massive to float on a single barge. The solution? Well, the early 20th century movers opted for the simple yet effective King Solomon approach. And so they cut the building in half. Very shoaly waters, very shallow waters. One, you have the house. So you have a tall structure, you have the wind blowing. Two, you're gonna have the current of the water. On a high tide situation, you have an opposing current pushing in. Having a structure that large and the conditions not being perfect, um, it's very dangerous. With the house section and the barge bobbing downriver, the moving team had managed to successfully transport the now nearly half-century-old building to its new home. Well, I do know um, early 1900s, I believe, it came on a barge along the Manatee River in two halves, and we're now into the 74th season of That's doing place. It is, it really is. It was originally used for uh, community gatherings, I guess during World War II. There are USO kind of dances here for servicemen who are on leave. And it has been in its present location since then, so for a, a hundred years. Uh, it's unbelievable to me that it is as old as it is, and we've been here as long as we have. Unbelievable for community theater. And it wasn't as big as, as it is now. There were additions put onto it over the years. When the, I first moved to Florida in the 80s, the building was a little bit smaller than this. The, the place we're sitting right now, which is the lobby, was added on um, maybe 20 years ago or so. And uh, the expansion was uh, a real lifesaver for the, the theater. Very few in changes, interior changes, have been done. Uh, since I've been here, and like I said, I, I, I actually, you know, helped create spaces uh, for a men's dressing room, which was non-existent. Yeah. This is the luxurious male changing room. They were changing in the uh, in, in what what is the the kitchen area, <laughs> where the sinks were, where the refrigerator was. We've added a box office, which has given us more space, so then we can print tickets. But the rest of the building has actually remained the same. Obviously, we have continuous maintenance work to do on it because it is an older building. And saying older building is putting it lightly. The Gillett House was used as the island's community hall, a tourism center a Baptist church, a veteran service club, a meeting place for the island's women's club, a schoolhouse, and finally, a community theater. And then in the early, early 1950s, right around 1950, 49, 50, two people met on the beach, a gentleman and a woman, and they said, a gentleman said, I'm involved in theater. The woman said, I'm kind of involved in theater. Hey, there's this building there. Let's start a theater. And that's, that's a simple version of the story, but that's that's pretty, pretty accurate. The woman was Helen Peters, and her chance encounter with a gentleman by the name of Harold Igo started a multi-decade spanning journey that created what is now known as the Anna Maria Island Players. Together, Peters and Igo orchestrated a meeting to establish a community theater in the old Gillett homestead. And almost immediately after the Players were founded, the Anna Maria Island Women's Club recommended Igo direct the theater's first play, a production of Ladies in Retirement a show based on the 1941 film of the same name. The show was performed in 1950 and was a hit. Roger Stonehouse, the player's first president, had this to say. And so we are encouraged to make our debut, not to strut our stage nor to be impressive, but to afford a source of entertainment for the whole island by the abundant talent of the whole island. And you said it's your birthday coming up, right? Wednesday. Wednesday, wow. Well, one of Oh, when I came here, uh, I lived on the island down the street. I lived next door to a very nice gal, and I was bored to death because I had a nice social life in Savannah, Georgia, and I missed that, you know, and I had nothing here. So she said, how about coming over and helping out at the theater? And I said, what theater? She said, a little place on the corner. 
I said, oh, okay. Well, I didn't know that helping out meant getting on my hands and knees and scrubbing the stage floor, but I, it was better than nothing. <laughs> so I did it. <laughs> I got started because I it was in elementary school and I wanted to be on stage because a group of Boy Scouts came in and they did a little panorama of what you do as a Boy Scout. And I wanted to be the actor who got to wield the ax and hatchet and chop up the firewood. It was just beautiful. Yeah. But weapons told me to That's right. <laughs> I'm surprised I'm not on the med medieval fair circuit. <laughs> we came on holiday here by accident in uh, 1990. Uh, and loved it so much, came back, and then we had the cho uh, chance of my husband working out here. So that's how we got here. Unfortunately, I didn't settle and uh, was quite unhappy at the time. It was the theatre that changed that. How many uh, presidents have there been? Right, I would say probably 35, 40, something like that. I have outstayed my welcome. Because of COVID, um, they decided not to get rid of me. And so I've now been doing it four and a half years. So. I'm sure there's a couple more reasons to Well, but possibly. <laughs> I hope so. Yeah, I've been president of this there. And um, I think they've done a good job over time. And I thought it, this theater wasn't going to last but maybe 10 years. And that was my thinking in 67. <laughs> and here we are in 2022. I can't believe I'm sitting in the lobby, which wasn't here then. <laughs> and people schedule their vacations around the time that we have plays so that they can come to this theater. I mean, we've progressed immensely. You know, we used to take orders and write them down on a big cardboard thing and you erased the name and put the next name in and the seat numbers. And I have that still, by the way. Wow. So it's, it's a good reminder how far we've come. And we're still inching towards more progression as far as uh, online sales and et cetera, et cetera. I was a re little reluctant about that in the beginning, but it's progress and we have to make progress. From a monetary sense, I get it. You know, the police force are getting Low thousands of dollars, you know, the, the city council are getting thousands of dollars, but we need people. Money isn't going to cut it. We need humans to make this happen. And people who care. People who really care about carrying on the history of this is really important. We have to carry this on. It's non-negotiable. We just need humans to do it. Come on, humans. <laughs> when we have such a facility and such opportunity, sometimes it's a little sad when it doesn't get to make it out into the world in the ways that we would like to send those little tendrils, you know? So, so yeah, staying on the island, absolutely. Keeping the history of this space, 3,000%. Improving upon what we have. I mean, if you're gonna donate, we got it. <laughs> Tourism here has taken off in the last, even since I've been here. Yeah. Uh, 10, 15 years, whereby it's grown. So we have a different kind of audience now. You can feel the, the history of some of the shows and the imprint that they leave within the space. So you have the echoes of the past with the promise of the future. Why do you think community theater is important? I think it cultivates budding passions and appreciation for things outside of your comfort zone. And I think that community theater is an excellent way to help not only educate and enlighten the people in the community who are experiencing it, but also the people themselves who are getting to take that on themselves. You, you grow with every role that you take. Yeah, I just think it's quite, quite, a, quite a beautiful way to color the world. Community theater is a great place to get your passion for theater out. It's a great place to try out what you can do and grow as an actor, as opposed to only doing college or professional theater. It, it, it bridges a gap, if you will. 
oh, I think it's very important. People that would never dream of going on the stage, it makes them more outgoing once they get on the stage. Well, it's like all theater, isn't it? It's a bringing together. It's very important for younger people, people that perhaps want to get in theater, don't know how to get in theater, want to do things other than acting, lighting, sound, props. It brings people together. And that's why this particular theater is in everybody's heart. I mean, it, it brings people together, but it's also educational. There's something to be learned uh, from seeing a show. And sometimes uh, people can uh, see themselves as, as some of the characters. And uh, one particular show that I did, I, I had a, I had to play a, a character that had a, um, a heart attack. The way the character recovered really touched a lot of people, and I've had, actually had somebody come up to me and say that that uh, I helped their husband deal with uh, this heart attack. So it's stuff like that that really um, makes you think and, and say, oh, you know, I, I'm, I'm doing something that means something to people. There are lots and lots of people, at least in this area, I'm assuming in most areas of the country, who would like to do theater, but they don't have the ability to travel to be a professional, and they're no longer in school. That has been my case. I did not have the ability to travel and go for a professional status. So I chose to stay with a normal job, a normal family man, and still pursue my passion in community theaters. In the industry, uh, it's all professional theater in a way. In a way, it's one big community. So in a way, it's all community theater. I think it's wonderful because we have this entertainment for not only people who live here, but all these visitors. And many of them come from places where they're very involved in theater. And this is an area that's becoming more and more and more artsy. And all the arts are really focused on a lot. So to have this is a huge asset for our community. It's unbelievable to some of the visitors that we get from all over the world that cannot believe that this theater has been here this long, staffed by volunteers for the most part. And we are all a big family. We look after each other and we help each other and that's what makes it work. It just so happened that um, we settled in Anna Maria. Um, we, we settled here because we decided that, well, it looks like a nice place, you know, but any place that has a theatre can't be all bad. Where do you see the island players going in the future? I hope they stay right here on Anna Maria Island. <laughs> well, my overall would be I'd like it to be here in another 74 years. The building's not going to change very much. Uh, that's just, uh, this is it. I really don't want us to change too much. I don't see him tearing it down and build, build, putting up a new building. I don't see that happening. I think it, it, the island would lose its flavor if something like that ha happened, so. I would hope that we would continue to progress forward with the direction that we have, the positive momentum, maybe a little more into the 21st century insofar as accessibility goes. Moving forward, uh, good plays, good actors, uh, and just to carry on. I think everybody that has worked here in whatever capacity has loved the theater. It's got this special, I, don't, I can't even describe it. It's kind of got this special thing in our hearts. I couldn't agree with you more. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's where Island players can go, is going, and I'm, I'm, I'm in praise of that. And I see it continuing. I, I don't see it as a 10-year venture anymore. I see it as something that is a part of the island. I think this building can teach us a lot. 
It doesn't really matter what you were made for or what you feel like you were cut out to do. There's always gonna be another purpose for us out there, even if it means cutting you in half and shipping you down a river on a barge. But clunky metaphors about the human condition aside, there is one thing I do know. This place means so much to so many. Whether you like stagecraft like Heiko, Sylvia, Talia, or Mark, or you like history like Barb or Liz, or maybe you just like to see a good show every once in a while like Dorothy and me. Chances are you can find what you're looking for right here, right at home. And even if you don't live in an idyllic paradise like us, community theater is everywhere. Go out and watch a show, audition, maybe help with lights or sound. There are people in your community waiting for you. Chances are you'll be up on that stage, inspiring the next generation. Or maybe you'll just have a fun story to tell. In the playbills here at the Island Players, there's a section devoted to the history of the theater. And at the end, there's a request. Take a look around you and spend a few moments thinking about all those who came before us, who lived, learned, worked, worshiped, acted, laughed, and enjoyed this special place. Whether you've thought about it or not, by being here tonight, you have also become a part of the ongoing history of the Island Players. And as John Donne put it hundreds of years ago, no man is an island. So maybe it's time for us to come together as a community.